Rail uh, Infrastructure Manager, which is an organization that defends the the interest of in, uh, of uh, excuse me <laughs> um, infrastructure managers to the European Union. Thanks for being here with us. We also have Alberto Alonso, which is a CFO and Strategy Director of EMT. EMT is the organization that's in charge of um, planning and managing the urban mobility in the city of Madrid. Thank you for being here with us. And we also have Jorge Muñoz, Electric Mobility Manager at Iberdrola, which as you all um, are aware, it's one of the largest uh, Spanish energy uh, company. So let's, <laughs> thanks for being here with us. And we also have Claudia, Claudia which will be our chat moderator. Yes. Um, let's begin with Adif, uh, Maria Luisa. We were saying that uh, many countries are um, trying to achieve uh, sustainable transformation. Um, you have a vast experience at Adif. So just walk us through uh, how uh, the railways are um, doing this transition and how do you more specifically implement it in Spain? Okay, thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. And as you have said, Adif is uh, the infrastructure railway manager in, in Spain. So we are in charge of design, construction, maintenance, and operation of our railway network. We have more than 16,000 kilometers, and two thirds of them are for commuters, uh, regional, uh, long and medium distance uh, conventional lines. So if we focus on conventional lines, on overall on commuters, uh, they provide um, uh, they are a key for the cleaner and congested urban uh, mobility for big cities, as you said, uh, overall for very big cities like Barcelona or, or Madrid. So uh, for us, it's so important to provide reliable and safe uh, services. And overall, we try to push more users to uh, go to, to uh, railways because in that question, in that, in that uh, way, we will avoid uh, congestion and uh, pollution. So to ensure these uh, reliable services, uh, we need a reliable network. And I think maybe the most important related with the, the other panelists is the multimodal stations. So uh, what we are doing now and partly related with the liberalization of uh, passengers uh, process, uh, we are now enhancing and increasing the needs and the shape of uh, our stations and transforming them into multimodal uh, transport um, uh, hubs. So we are going to have more trains, more passengers, but what is more important, I think, is we are connecting with other modes of, of transport. We are also digitalization. Our, our stations transforming cities because one advantage of railways is that we enter in the city center and uh, with a, a kind of a zero emission area around us, uh, we call it Ecomilla. Uh, we are promoting uh, this exchange to different modes, but more sustainable uh, modes of transport. Let's narrow the scope now to from Spain to Madrid. Why is Madrid such a role model here? What does the city? What role does the city play in this transformation? Right. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I think Madrid uh, began planning this uh, some years ago, right? So where nowadays we have a very integrated uh, public transport network, and uh, this means that we have a short haul railways as. Uh, Marisa was saying, and also then we have a very good, reliable, fast and good uh, connections through uh, metro and the ground and uh, also buses. So I think the, here the, the, the key point to have a, um, uh, an efficient uh, network is to combine the three modes, I would say. So, so we were talking about multimodal strategies, and this is the case, right? Trains uh, plus metros plus uh, buses. In, um... intervention um, we have the, the railways already electrified we have the metro electrified and then we are in the process to uh, to to the electric transitions regarding the EMT which uh, holds and, and operates the the buses interface so uh, yeah thank you and Jorge, what role does Iberdrola play in all of this? Uh, thanks. Um, Iberdrola is involved in, in the whole value chain of the electric infrastructure for charging uh, EVs, electric vehicles. So we are present from the residential segment uh, to 
the tracks, let's say, uh, going through companies, going through public charging for like uh, vehicles or or heavy heavy vehicles and uh, buses. So uh, right now we have installed over sixty thousand charging points of all kinds all over the world. Uh, specifically in Spain, it's uh, around it's over fifty thousand, and we are proud to to say that we are uh, leaders in public charging network in Spain with seven thousand charging points. But also uh, we have agreements with uh, most uh, car manufacturers. We work for them and we work with them uh, to install charging points for them. We work with uh, public authorities and. Uh, let's say, urban transport uh, public companies like EMT uh, to, to help them to electrify uh, the, the depots uh, and, and also to, to help uh, companies to electrify. So um, the, the main reason uh, here uh, for Iberdola, the, the, the main objective, it's how to help everyone who is doing a big effort the companies who are be, be buying buses, but also the manufacturers who are building uh, trucks, building uh, buses, building, building building vehicles, to be able to charge those cars and to and to make electric mobility possible. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Maria Luisa, to you. Um, you briefly mentioned in your introduction the Spanish railway liberalization. So uh, two points here. First of all, what are the positive outcomes of the process and what's your global assessment? on liberalizing? Well, liberalization of uh, the passenger um, uh, system means that we have opened to competency. And uh, I think the process was quite well prepared because we were speaking with all uh, shareholders, not only with the operators, but all people interested in the process. So after having listened to everyone, I think it was quite well executed. And uh, the reality now that we are... uh, uh, developing the first phase of the process is that uh, we can uh, uh, say uh, quite proudly that uh, we have got a model shift, which is the the most important. Uh, Many uh, different people from uh, different modes of transport uh, have uh, come to to railways in this way. Um, The the, the process, as I said, was a success because uh, we are now the only country where three companies are competing and operating in the same corridor. And not only three companies, because uh, the incumbent, Renfe, uh, has opened a second brand, uh, a low-cost brand, uh, Ablo. So in fact, we have four brands competing in the same corridor. And uh, partly of the success is the price of the tickets. Uh, The decrease of the price is around 40% of the previous prices. Another uh, important success is that uh, the number of passengers have increased. The media is 30%, but in some corridors like Madrid, Valencia, to the east of the country, it has doubled the number of passengers. So it's, it's a big success. And the third and maybe the, more import, the most important success is that uh, there are more high-speed services. So citizens now have more opportunities to travel. So better prices and more trains. Uh, so uh, as we have increased the capacity for operators, they have increased the capacity for passengers. At this moment, we are working to open market uh, to new operators in uh, new different lines. And uh, for sure, that means that we have more trains in our network. So that means that we need more maintenance. So uh, everything is is a circle because uh, more trains means more incomes for us. And so we have the possibility to reinvest in the network and also to increase the, the maintenance, which is so important because every day trains are running 300 kilometers per hour. So we have to to, to get the perfect safety, the, the perfect feasibility for the, net, the the whole network. So I think we can say a Spanish model is right. In fact, in Europe, they are speaking about the, the Spanish case. Uh, but the most important is that the market reacted to this uh, movement we did, reacted very positive. For sure, there is room for improvement. So uh, what we are doing is studying uh, slowly and very calmly all uh, uh, what we have said we have done. Uh, but something which is very important is that we have invested a lot in our network, and now we are capitalizing these investments. So that's very very important because we used um, uh, citizens' uh, money. So now we are giving back to them the advantages of this liberalization. Uh, process. I think maybe we could resume that it is socially just that more people now can afford uh, moving in uh, high speed. Mm -hmm. What about the funding? 
of all of it. Yes, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, railways are uh, great, very sustainable, but it is true that uh, it, they require large investments. That's for sure. And not only during the construction, because we always have in mind that construction is quite expensive. I think it's very important to take into account that it, is, it requires investment to the maintenance as it has to be so safe. Uh, so um, at this moment, I think we are living what we could say a golden age for railways, because if you look around all over the world, uh, all international institutions like the European Union, banks like the European Investment Bank, like the, the World Bank, uh, are financing uh, railways uh, all abroad. So uh, we usually say that railways have momentum. And uh, Adif has invested since 2005, the creation of the company, over 58 billion euros in the in the in the network. Um, mainly, the the the, um, the money comes from the state, but also from European funds and also from uh, private banks. Uh, so uh, at this moment, uh, we have an uh, uh, important amount of uh, European uh, funds. In fact, with the recovery and resilience uh, facility, uh, we have had up to 6 billion euros uh, to invest in infrastructures, not only high speed. I have to say that now we are investing more in, in, in uh, commuters and conventional lines. But um, the disadvantage is that the schedule is very tight because we have to finish these investments by the summer 2026. By now, at least at the moment, Adif has uh, met all the deadlines of the of the funds. That's quite important. And I spoke before about uh, private banks. So uh, we are um, pioneers in uh, green, bond, green bonds. Since uh, 2017, we have opened seven different packs and we have got 4 billion euros. Uh, and I have to say that the demand always was larger than the, the offer we, we opened. And uh, anyway, we have uh, invested a lot of money, but we have to go on working because for sure uh, we can be more efficient. So what we have to think is about sustainability from all points of view. So uh, we have to be not only sustainable uh, environmentally speaking, but uh, for sure uh, financially speaking. So every time when we calculate if uh, a line, a new line or a new um, uh, construction is, uh, uh, is interesting for us, we have to study the economic sustainability. And we have to think that electrified railways is, uh, has less emissions and less externalities. That's important because uh, we are reducing accidents, uh, congestion in our, in our uh, roads. So, and, and something which is uh, very important, I, I said before, is that profiting that the stations are in the city center, we are also transforming cities. And I think that's quite important in this, in this moment and related with the, uh, the, the panel. Any specific, specific projects that you would like to, to highlight? Uh, now we are working in the four main stations in, in Spain, but maybe the most visible one is uh, Chamartín. Chamartín is the station placed in the north of uh, Madrid, the capital of the, of the city. And the transformation we are uh, working in at this moment is not only for the railway station, because it's also related with buses, also related with underground. And overall, it is transforming the whole area of the city because uh, a new park is going to be uh, created on top of the, of the tracks and also new uh, facilities, not, so, not only for housing, but also for uh, companies and hotels to be around the, the station. So uh, the multimodality is assured and all, also the way this new uh, uh, neighborhood is going to move if you uh, place there all the different motors transport and the core of the high speed network. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alberto, um, more specifically on Madrid, if you could walk us through the, the decarbonization um, process of the public transportation and the, the electrification of the fleet in Madrid. Right. Okay, so the beginning of the story is perhaps, I mean, some, some years ago when we decided uh, and we implemented this in our strategic plan to change from diesel to natural gas. So this decision was made some years ago, and then uh, we began this transition. For us, it was important to, to move towards uh, natural gas uh, because uh, you avoid um, uh, oxide of nit nitrogen emissions. Right, which is which is something very polluting for, for for the cities. Actually, more than CO2. Right. So one of the big benefits is that we could, I mean, we could uh, we could uh, lesser the emissions in terms of NOx. Right. 
And then, uh, so we had a program, like a quite ambitious program uh, regarding acquisition of uh, natural gas buses. And uh, three years ago, we ended with diesel buses, right? So this was, I mean, very beneficial for the city itself and for public transportation, especially. Uh, and then we began, I mean, we've been always uh, dealing with several technologies at the same time, right? So once uh, we knew that we wanted to finish with diesel, uh, we began exploring uh, electric buses. Um, and then I have to say that today, uh, or at the end of this year, we'll have, this year we'll have uh, 440 electric buses, which, uh, is, which accounts for uh, it's more or less 20% of the fleet, right? And the rest is a natural gas buses. So the, 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 the whole fleet was, is composed by 2,100 buses, which are the, the inner city buses. Okay, I'm not counting the metropolitan uh, buses who serve the, the, the metropolitan area, mm -hmm. right? But uh, talking about the inner city, we have uh, 2,100. Uh, out of that, we have 1,700 uh, natural gas buses, specifically a compressed natural gas. And the rest is uh, electric. And now we have, uh, we've decided to, to stop purchasing uh, natural gas buses and then moving forward to the, uh, towards the electrification, right? So we have, again, an ambitious program uh, to, uh, to purchase uh, these electric buses, um, take into consideration that to, to, to do their whole movement, right? Uh, at an average price of uh, half a million euros in, in Europe, Okay, which is the cost of an electric uh, bus, uh, will be spending more than 1 billion euros in the forthcoming years. Uh, but this is the, the, the path that we want to follow. Uh, so the, the strategy of the company and the strategy of the local government, in this case, the government of Madrid, is to, uh, to have ended the whole process uh, within the year 2033. Okay, so this means that we'll be, we'll be um, uh, changing or purchasing around 200 buses per year. So the, I mean, the effort in terms of budget is, is quite important. Uh, and, but it'll be completed talking about buses in, 30, 30, in 2033. Then at the same time, what I have, at the same time, uh, we are following a decarbonization or, or strategy uh, uh, further than what is the, the acquisition of the uh, electric buses. And, um, Meanwhile, we are uh, transitioning from, from natural gas, conventional natural gas, to biomethane. Okay, this means that, I mean, we are trying to get this biomethane, which is a renewable gas, right, from, the, uh, from some several uh, solid waste treatment plants around Madrid. Uh, that is where we get this, this uh, biomethane, right? And we are, um, we are uh, uh, thinking of increasing, okay, the... the number of megawatts that we consume uh, of biomethane, right? So uh, this, is a, 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 this is part of the, part of the uh, transition strategy and is also very important. And lately, uh, since, uh, since we uh, always want to, to have several technologies, uh, we are working on the, uh, I mean, we're setting up a new uh, hydrogen uh, facility. So this mm -hmm. means that uh, within the, I mean, within this year, We'll have operating a, a pilot with hydrogen, right, uh, to serve uh, twenty buses, right. But uh, but if we, I mean, if we see the, the, I mean, if we see the whole period from from now to twenty thirty three, the idea is that uh, at the end of the, of that year, uh, the, the the whole fleet will be completely electric. Mm -hmm. And uh, but so, so so this is the, the strategy. Along with that. Obviously, I mean we have to we have to be consistent, and we need to to uh, build up some de depots, mm -hmm. right? Specifically, two new depots, uh, because otherwise you cannot sell the buses, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, so we have to build infrastructures, and then we have to invest another uh, two hundred million euros. So at the end, this is one billion plus five hundred million euros. So of course it's costly, and I understand Madrid has a lot of um, next generation funds. Um, I wanted to ask you, how does it work, and how do you implement them in the city? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, we um, well, we created a group uh, to to work on on, on European funds, specific specifically as um, uh, Marisa said, uh, RRF. 
funds coming from next generation and we got more than we got uh, 160 million euros so uh, in in, uh, in in grants right so we applied that to the uh, acquisition of new buses i mean if you consider that the the, the price of a electric bus is around 600,000 uh, euros and the average price of a, a natural gas or diesel bus is 300,000 if you apply uh, around 200,000 euros for a uh, in, in 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 grants okay to the acquisition of the of the new electric buses at the end you more or less compensate yeah the gap that you had and so this is what uh, this is precisely what we did in these recent years okay now we don't have uh, European funds anymore, but uh, still the, the, the balance structure of the company is, is, is very solid. So this means that we'll be able to, to, uh, to leverage the company in order to accomplish with the strategic plan. Right? So we are not worried. Uh, I mean, we were very happy with the European funds, but now that we have to, to, uh, to keep on investing, I mean, the, the solid uh, balance structure will allow us to do it without problems. <laughs> So you do have alternatives, yes. Yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah, we have. Uh, I would say, I would say that uh, uh, beside, I mean, besides the grants and the loans that we can get from, uh, or in this case, also from the European Investment Bank or from commercial banks, um, when we talk about the uh, construction of the new depots, uh, we are thinking about PPPs, all right, uh, public-private partnerships. So this means that, uh, I mean, at the end, in, in the form of concessions. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, we will uh, launch public tenders in order the, the, to, to, to the, the private investors to come and they will they will invest. OK. And, and we will make, we'll make variable those costs. OK. So at the end, you, you convert CapEx in OPEX if you want, which is which is interesting. OK. It's another formula to um, to add on top of the uh, uh, of the of the direct capes that we invest uh, regarding the buses, so we 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 have like a combination of strategies in, in terms of finances. Perfect. Thank you so much. And now back to Iberdrola. Um, well, financing is crucial to electrification projects. Um, what's the criteria, and what are the the technical challenges to fund such infrastructures? Okay. Uh, here, I mean, and what the, the question is: Why is so crucial uh, funding? So we are we are moving from a world in which the the asset the customers used to buy was cheap, and the the thing yeah, that you used to put in there was not so cheap. So you were uh, spending out of money during the lifetime of uh, of the vehicle, whatever the vehicle was, uh, and uh, there was needs for funding but it was not so important so now we are moving to the electric mobility world in which vehicles are very expensive infrastructure is very expensive and a uh, funding is needed another question uh, is and what's what are the business models behind those uh, be, behind this because uh, okay we can have funding but is it profitable when is it profitable uh, and uh, we are a we are a private company, and we need we need to look for profitability in the projects. So right now, uh, I think in all over the world and and uh, in in many countries, there are subsidies and there are grants for for many activities. There are grants for for this pub, uh, public transport, but there are uh, subsidies for cars, uh, for infrastructure, uh, and this is helping to uh, a little bit to ease the investment that is needed. Uh, and, and and to start to 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 create this infrastructure, these cars. But the truth is that even with those grants, the in the best case scenario that we see, uh, when we invest, for example, in public charging network, we are seeing returns in five, six, seven, eight years time at the end of this decade, uh, and and that's complicated. To, to to create a, a business model because uh, we are not saving uh, costs as the EMT could be doing. We are, let's say, merchant. Uh, it's I'm investing here and I don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I'm betting that there's going to be a demand and I'm betting that I'm going to recover. I'm getting, uh, in the end, uh, I'm going to earn money with that, but maybe not. 
uh, maybe the cars are not going to to grow up uh, as I expected, uh, the trucks or or other things. So uh, right now, uh, in the two activities that we, that we do, in 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 some cases we we sell to customers like uh, EMT, uh, and we are depending on their final uh, their funding. And if they 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 didn't have those good accounts, so they can keep activity of uh, transforming uh, electric uh, normal uh, buses to electric buses. Uh, they could stop after the the end of the grants. So there's one part that what the customers have and how they fund the investments that they are buying, and we are we are building and facilitating to them. But there's another part in which we invest. And uh, in that part of the investment uh, is where we need to we need to 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 work with the subsidies that are disappearing, and specifically in Spain are very difficult to get. Uh, uh, <laughs> you love that that's that's the that's the case, and the 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 uncertainty in the market. Uh, but uh, even though we are we are still we are investing, we 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 are planning to invest over one thousand uh, one billion dollars euros uh, by the end of this decade on on charging infrastructure. But uh, we we have uh, some uncertainty about what's going to happen to the customers and what's going to happen in into into um, in two aspects. One, the vehicles. What are going to happen with the vehicles when there is no that money flow which is uh, being uh, pumped into the into the mm-hmm. economy uh, and what's going to happen with uh, with the ability for them to fund themselves the infrastructure if they are in, if they are going to to need us to fund that infrastructure so that would be increasing our plans of investing mm-hmm. uh, and we need to allocate uh, money for that and we need to and we need to we need to do the numbers uh, and we need to to understand that that's going to be that's that's going to be profitable in the end. Uh, uh, so so those so you those have are a contingency plan in in the no, face I mean, of this. I mean, uh, we, we we are here as as I was saying before. We are here to to promote electric mobility. I mean, we are a, we are an, a utility. So we generate, we distribute, we we sell. That's a of a, the 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 reason for for us to be to be here. We really believe on the on the carbonizing, so so that's part of our ADM. And uh, the thing here is how we can, in a very changing env- changing environment of profitability, funding grants, uh, availability of money, uh, interest rates, and everything which is happening in in this world with with needs a lot of investing, how we can facilitate that uh, and still be. Uh, uh, still uh, keep the profitability, mm-hmm. uh, which is which is uh, going to suffer some stretches during during this decade until we can see a clear uh, a clear growth uh, uh, of electric cars uh, and and electric mobility. You mentioned that you guys partnered with EMT. Sometimes there's a project, the inverted pantograph. If you could just share with us what what's it about. Uh, the the project in uh, as we have uh, commented previously and yesterday the project in in the EMT it's uh, uh, they are very, very humble to to say to say that but it's but it's uh, I would say uh, one of the best projects in terms of uh, electric mobility for for buses that that we have seen the way they they have they have uh, set it up the the the, way, the design. Um, the there are several key aspects uh, which make that project very special, uh, which are uh, the the layout of the of the all the charging infrastructure, uh, how they are disposed, they are disposing the the chargers, uh, um, betting, uh, which maybe now it's it's a little bit more clear, but but not so much so, uh, when when I think they they they, they did all that uh, about the pantographs. Um, and and everything that all those things that they can they can speak to you, but the pantographs I think it's a, although it they cost money and they are going to cost money to 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 the to the companies who are going to use it. I think it's the best solution for urban transport because all the all the buses uh, have a, a lot of movement. They uh, the charging 
uh, by by the drivers, uh, it's more problematic if someone has uh, needs to switch uh, the cable. Uh, it's automated. It's uh, more intelligent. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, very reliable. Uh, so so I think the pantograph, uh, which is which is uh, starting to be very 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 popular. Uh, for this specific uh, sector of, of buses, it's uh, it's uh, the, the, the most interesting thing for for them to do. Mm-hmm. Although it's it's not it's not cheap. <laughs> well, long term investment then. Uh, well, thank you so much. And now we're gonna open the floor to to some questions uh, within the audience, also online questions, Claudia. So yeah, feel free to to jump in and to ask anything you want to our panelists. Let me comment. Let me comment mm-hmm, something sure. regarding the uh, inverted uh, pantographs. Uh, uh, what is interesting regarding the EMT is that um, since we do like an, an average distance of 220 kilometers per day, uh, we can charge inside inside the depots, right? So we don't have opportunity charge in the streets. Okay, and this means that we can have all this infrastructure in our own depots, uh, which is which is very convenient because at the end of the day we charge the uh, the buses. Uh, during nighttime, right, which is a valley hour, and the energy is cheaper, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, well, I absolutely agree uh, with Jorge in the sense that the, the, I mean, the, this idea of inverted uh, pantographs is is very, I would say, is very uh, modern but very efficient. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's 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 a story of success, really. Mm-hmm. And and so the the relationship of both companies is is very fruitful. Yeah, and, so and, we are very happy. And something important that I haven't, uh, I didn't say, it's uh, the health and safety related with that. All the electrified components are very far away from any person, so the the risk of of accidents uh, it's going to be negligible with all those uh, with uh, pantographs, which mm-hmm. is very important. Question over there. So. Yes, well, it's not a question; it's just a comment to 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 give more information about that. The issue is not only electric pantograph and so on, but also Iberdrola is um, helping or cooperating with TMB at, in Barcelona with hydrogen for for the with green hydrogen for for the hydrogen fleet. And in fact, that was the case that we that we explained here last year. Yes. Go ahead. You have to push the left button. Yeah. The left one. Yes. Um, On the oh, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, uh, thank you very much. My name is Enrique Huertas from Buchanan. I have a question, or rather two, for the panel. I'm not going to address it to any particular member of it, but uh, um, yeah, congratulations on the great success of ADIF in uh, in transforming uh, high-speed rail passenger, especially with the liberalization of the market and also to the um, EMT in transforming uh, well, urban uh, surface transport, right? My question is, uh, we, we just had a meeting here just yeah, just before this one, uh, and it was on uh, walking and cycling and, uh, well, active travel as a means of really ensuring that cities become green. How do you actually envisage, from your point of view, that uh, we could actually bridge that gap between metropolitan mobility and urban mobility, you bring passengers from interchange, uh, long distance relationships and high speed rail. Uh, But then uh, we know that uh, we have very clear patterns of uh, metropolitan mobility that are currently um, achieved by private vehicles. And um, we all know uh, the side effects of, uh, of them. Uh, Of course, low emission zones uh, are meant to help the transformation of some of that mobility into electric. But how do you envisage uh, that the city, in this case Madrid or larger cities, 
uh, should be in the next following years, say 10 years ahead from us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Marisa, or... I'm going to start with Maria, Maria Luisa and then okay. go to Alberto. Right. Okay, I'll start. Okay, I think you have said something which is quite important. It is that um, now we know the different uh, ways you can um, arrive to a station, but who knows in 10 years? Because if you ask me six years ago, I would have never said that a person could arrive uh, in um, a patinete. A scooter. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's a challenge for us because I think we have to design the stations with a huge degree of flexibility because we don't exactly know what the future is going to be. But now what we are doing is promoting the more sustainable means of transport in the closer area of the, of the station. As I said, the Ecomilla is a project that uh, it tries to attract people arriving to the station in share cars, for example, or share scooters or electric uh, different uh, ways of having. If you come um, by your own car, you will have a parking, but maybe you will have to walk uh, 15 minutes to arrive to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the tracks. So uh, this moment is the way we have to promote it. But for sure, we have to work together with the city and to work with the um, urban other systems because uh, the, the best way for arriving to the city center should be by bus, by uh, metro, walking, that would be great, but not by private car. Or if you want to, to be in, in a car, not your private car, also a shared car. But it's, it's not only a question of investment, it's not only a question of, of um, uh, working the, the public uh, social, um, um, uh, administrations. I think it's also a cultural question and we have to work on that uh, all together. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, to give you some figures, uh, uh, Madrid has uh, more than, it's like 7.7 like um, million uh, journeys daily. And then you have more than one third, around around thirty six percent, thirty seven percent, which is active walking, right? So uh, then you have five million journeys which are mechanized, if you want, right? And then half of those are private vehicles and half uh, public uh, transport, right? So um, so two point five million journeys are made by either metro or uh, EMT, right? Buses. Um, so, I mean, my first remark would be that the, the, the walking is, 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 is quite a big percentage of, of these journeys. So and, uh, at the end, I think Madrid is, 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 is a city where you can walk on, right? It's quite friendly in this sense. Um, and then uh, we are introducing micro-mobility. Right? So, I mean, not only scooters, but we have, a, 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 I didn't speak about this, but we have, a, 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 I would say, a very good system of uh, electric bikes. Okay, we are increasing the uh, number of journeys daily uh, dramatically, and I think that's, that uh, still will increase in the, in the coming years. So at the end, uh, what we're looking for is a, a multi-model uh, um, structure of, of journeys where we foster the, the active walking, and uh, we also foster the uh, use of public transport. So, so, so the idea is to reduce the uh, private vehicle, but uh, not banning, but incentivizing, okay, leaving the cars outside the city. So I think this, this is this is a bit of philosophy, but it's very important mm -hmm. from my perspective, right? So we don't think that banning things is, is the correct way, but incentivizing. And in this sense, we are doing so, and we are doing so with a good bikes system and also with a good quality, reliable and, and, and speed um, means of transport uh, regarding public transport. Mm -hmm. So this is the idea. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we do have some questions online, Claudia. Yeah, okay. thank you. There is actually one question online. It says, how has Spain accomplished having accessible charging stations for everyone? Yeah. Very generic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit generic. Uh, I, mean, I mean, regarding... Uh, public uh, charging stations, as I said before, uh, we have those charging uh, stations and inside, right? So there is no problem to, to accomplish that with the, with the uh, public transport requirements, right? So, so this is solved regarding us. And, and uh, I, 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 I can take the one for, for public charging. 
So um, the affordability of uh, of uh, the charging station, uh, more or less, if if you think what which are the costs of of uh, charging at the street, um, half of that would be the energy itself. Half of the price, more or less, would be the energy, uh, and in the other half, you need to to put the 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 cost of the infrastructure and and how you amortize it uh, and the and the return and the operating costs and and some other things related with maintenance and all that stuff so the the main the main driver for for reducing the cost it's uh, it's increasing the use i mean it, it looks like very simple but uh, the biggest use that that we could get the the energy what we see, it's uh, uh, it should uh, get lower. I mean, we have gone through uh, some years uh, in the world where the energy wars were expensive because of the lack of gas and, and everything which has uh, which has uh, uh, happened in the last two years. But the expectations right now is the energy to 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 go lower, uh, the electricity specifically. In Spain, we are in a good position because of the renewals and the and the electricity mix that we have. Uh, so it it should be quite stable. So one part should be lower, uh, with bigger use. The infrastructure and other costs should be diluted with uh, that bigger use. So uh, the summary full of this is that we expect that the charging is going to be inevitably lo- uh, lower and it's going to go down. Uh, the quicker it will, it will it will happen, it will be very linked with the with the amount of cars that there will be, with when the trucks, the electric cars are are, are, are will start to to be in the roads uh, and and all of that. But uh, I think the expectation should be good for for electricity price when I mean, for charging price. If you let me hear, a real wish can help. Uh, because uh, a large part of our network is electrified. And so we have two, two different kind of, of uh, projects. One of them is in the commuter stations. It's a good solution and the uh, citizens are demanding that if they come from their homes by car to the station and leave there the car to enter the city center. And then if you have a slow charge points, they can leave the car there. And then while they are in Madrid or Barcelona or wherever, the car is charging, so they go back home. That's one model, and it works. But another model is that sometimes uh, our lines, our railway lines, go in parallel, more or less, to roads, but not uh, uh, electric uh, lines. So sometimes it's not easy for electric uh, companies to uh, uh, give the electricity, but it's easier for us. And so we have a, a project which is called, okay. In English, it's a bit complicated. In Spanish, a uh, petrol station is called gasolinera. So the project is called ferrolinera. That means it's a place where you go to get the, not the essence, the electricity. So ferro is the, the beginning of uh, railways in Spanish, ferrocarril. Uh, so this project, ferrolinera, uh, what means is that you provide a point uh, where to charge the car, but that electricity not only comes from the whole system, but also from the energy the train gives back to the system when they uh, use the brake. So that's uh, very interesting because it's so sustainable because you don't need to pro- to produce more electricity, but you recover from the system, system itself. So that's a good solution. And for sure, we are preparing a uh, quickly uh, charges because in that case, you are stopping in the middle of your, of your trip. So you cannot stay hours there, no? but it's a, a different project. And I think it can have a, a good future. Yes. Um, so I, I would like to make some some comments, no, because I, I was missing uh, some reflections on the need for public space, no, for for uh, active mobility, and in Spain, well, first that we have seen lately uh, great leadership. Now the Ministry of of Transport has uh, added new secretaries for sustainable mobility, and they are also thinking on the three S, no, in Spanish, movilidad sana, segura, y sostenible. I think this is great. This is something that uh, I've been talking with the Ministry of Cities in, in Brazil about trying to 
follow some same mentality. And this is shown, no? like uh, all the new interventions in roads along urban areas. This is also a model that I'm trying to replicate in, in Brazil. How the Ministry of Transport is really changing their mindsets. No? And, and this is uh, something incredible. It's not only about investing in decarbonization on electrification. No? It's also investing on a space for people to walk and people to cycle. So when you have cities which are really models, no? so Valencia did an impressive transformation during the last 10 years, no? like uh, then Pontevedra during the last 20 years, like, uh, and this is really proud from my region. No? And then uh, what Barcelona, Sevilla with the bicycles, etc. So really, uh, from what also can we do as technicians to convince the population, because we have seen lately some setbacks, cycleways being dismantled. So like uh, we really need to take out that from the political discussion and really push this forward to the center that we need to go all along and rowing on the same direction. No? So what's your, your view on that? <laughs> well, it's a cultural change that Maria Luisa was talking about, right? Oh, maybe it's not my speciality, but I, I totally agree with you. And uh, in the case of the roads, I think the, the specific word they're using is humanizing uh, roads when they cross uh, uh, city centers. For sure, it's very important because in some in some cases, there has been a, a new road outside of the city, but the former road remains like a road inside. It was nonsense. So it's giving it back to pedestrians and people in the city. So I totally agree with you. Um, I think that I really think the only way to convince people is by the use. Uh, for example, when you transform si some uh, streets, some roads inside the city and become pedestrian, at the beginning, everybody complains. Um, uh, retailers complain, uh, uh, citizens living there complain. But after a while, I don't know, in some cases, two years, five years, they realize that their kind of their, the quality of their lives has improved extraordinary. But the next neighborhood you uh, uh, pretend to become pedestrian, they complain again. So I think there's no way to convince people but using it and uh, that they realize that this transformation is for better. I personally think it's, it's the only way. Hmm. I, I would just... I would just say, I would like to say that I think Alberto was saying before that he... He didn't th uh, think that uh, probably banning was uh, a solution. Uh, I I think for the city center, uh, maybe banning is is not the best thing for the humans, but uh, but I think it's the only solution for, to to get to get rid of uh, cars in specific areas that we think we need to. Um. <laughs> policy discussion no and no, i mean i mean there's there's no discussion because the, the, the i mean this comes from the european union right so so we we are we're going to to uh, to understand this and set this and actually uh, we have like a restricted area in the in the city center where you cannot go with with diesel uh, vehicles and that's it and we are accomplishing that so no no debate right uh but my point was uh, was slightly different uh before this year, we had uh, around 3,000 bikes for the whole Madrid. And we were serving around 11 neighborhoods, right? Okay. And we had daily, we had around 15,000 journeys, okay? And then we decided to, to, to change the whole system. And we doubled the number of bikes in service. So now we have more than 7,000 7, bikes, right? So here... The interesting uh, point is that we tripled the number of journeys, right? So now we're having like more than uh, 40,000 journeys every day. So here there is, there is a positive correlation in the sense that when you have a good, I mean, when, when you supply and, you're, I mean, uh, and, and, you, and you let the supply curve to function and it, it's very positive. So, so here we double, uh, the, the the infrastructure and we triple the number of journeys. So 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 this is what I was referring to, right? That we have to you have to at the end of the day you have to incentivize uh, those modes of transport, right? And I mean uh, I agree with you that 
in, in, in big areas or big cities like Madrid or could be, uh, of course, or in London or Paris or even mid-sized cities. I mean, at the end, you need certain restrictions regarding mm -hmm. the, 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 the private traffic. I, I, I fully agree with you. Yeah. We do have uh, one more question. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you. I've worked 30 years with the World Bank uh, in the transport practice, so we benefit a lot from... Spanish experience in the sector, and particularly Madrid and, and Barcelona, advising many metros. Um, we'd like to say, I have two questions. I would like to pick on, on your point about, say, how you convince people. And clearly, in the bank slang, is you need some early wins in order to start moving and get credibility. So, in this respect, for example, we tend to discuss, say, what was done, but not necessarily the path that allow you to do that. So when you talk to World Bank uh, staff and so on, we'd be very interested in these kind of stories, right? Because actually it's what makes it feasible. Uh, the question is, uh, you, you mentioned uh, what you did with the railways, bringing competition, a very tough one, right? And then you were able to see that the cost went down. So my question to you, Marilisa, would be, what were the factors that allow private competition reduce the cost, and what did you do in terms of the regulation to make this possible? Say, so what were the changes? That, uh, what reforms were to be introduced in order to do that? And to what extent, say, you have to be prepared to really uh, meet certain standards as you have many, many operators. And then uh, to uh, Adrona, uh, Jorge, uh, when you read today about sustainable mobility, it's about the electric vehicles. Uh, in, in the end, you see that, right? What is the share that you see, for example, in Spain? And what are you expecting to see in terms of five years from now? Mm -hmm. And in terms of the path to accelerate that, plenty of reports that show uh, the path to electric mobility. Have you seen something of that, that you say, well, this, this is it. This is what I would suggest that from all this literature emerging. Mm -hmm. We have just, bear in mind, we have two minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe if I can't finish, I can explain you later. <laughs> okay, yes. okay. Uh, the regulation came from the, the European Union that we have to open to competence. And what we do that first was asking all the different operators interested in, in it. Uh, I think the, the most important is that the model of uh, the, the incumbent we had, Renfe, the model they have was AVE uh, product. And so it had a certain standard and a number of seats in the train because they have uh, one coach for cafeteria, for example, and they had business, they have tourists. Then the first company who started in competence in, in, competency in Madrid-Barcelona line was Uigo, and the model was totally different. Uh, they were just uh, one class. There are some seats which are a bit wider, but that's all. They don't have a cafeteria. So it's, we could say, a, a low-cost model. Immediately, Renfe, what did was with the same trains, transform them inside to provide these low-cost services. But in the case of Renfe, it's the same company. I mean, they have to uh, do a new business plan. And I think what we have seen, what is very, very interesting, is that the use of the trains. And from that, I think uh, state-owned companies have to learn a lot from private companies. Even though Wigo comes from SNCF and uh, uh, Irio comes from part of it from Italia, but they have a totally different model, the use of the trains. The time, once they arrive to one end of the line, the time they spend with the train is stopped. And so the number of kilometers they do during the month or during the time uh, life of the, of the train. So I think they build the... the um, uh, the business model and uh, now they complain that it's not profitable but for sure now they are trying to uh, attract uh, passengers uh, but uh, for sure the, the whole the whole system is going to be profitable <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> yeah, we don't have that okay. time <laughs> sorry <laughs> well, thank you so much for being Stop. here with us and thanks for attending thanks very much Si nos hacemos una foto, que nos hagan una foto.